taking all of his time. Thank you, Mr. President. President, leaders, quick adjustment. I stand before you on what I have always thought as the hallowed ground of democracy. In this room, American lives have been changed so dramatically in just my lifetime through so many of your legislative initiatives from the Civil Rights Act when I was a child through most recently the First Step Act laws that have provided major opportunities for Americans to move forward and upward and more fully enjoy all of the attributes of what has been the greatest nation on earth. I've seen the changes these laws have made through my clients every day for the past 36 years. These laws have enabled me to fight for their enjoyment of a fair stake in our American project. I stand before a group of 100 United States senators who have chosen to serve your country from all corners of this great nation, giving up all sorts of professions, time with family, and perhaps other more lucrative opportunities to serve your country. Mr. President, you are a man who so honorably served this nation in the Senate and in public service before your tenure here. It is an honor to appear in this historic hall of democracy, yet today that honor is tempered by an overriding feeling of grave concern. Grave concern for the danger to the institution of the presidency that I believe even convening these proceedings indicates. The joy I believed I would feel if I ever had the great privilege of appearing before this body is replaced by sadness and pain. My overriding emotion is frankly wanting to cry for what I believe these proceedings will do to our great, so long enduring, sacred constitution and to the American people on both sides of the great divide that now characterizes our nation. Esteemed members of the Senate, going forward with this impeachment trial of a former President of the United States is unconstitutional for reasons we have set out in our brief, some of which we'll focus on here, and as a matter of policy, it is wrong, as wrong can be for all of us as a nation. We are told by those who favor having these proceedings that we have to do it for accountability. But anyone truly interested in real accountability for what happened at the Capitol on July 6th, January 6th, would of course insist on waiting for a full investigation to be completed. Indeed, one is underway in earnest already, intent on getting to the bottom of what happened. Anyone interested in ensuring that it's truly the one or ones responsible from whom accountability is sought would more than willingly wait for the actual evidence, especially with new evidence coming in every day about pre-planning, about those who were involved, and about their agenda bearing no relationship to the claims made here. They say you need this trial before the nation can heal, that the nation cannot heal without it. I say our nation cannot possibly heal with it. With this trial, you will open up new and bigger wounds across the nation, for a great many Americans see this process for exactly what it is, a chance by a group of partisan politicians seeking to eliminate Donald Trump from the American political scene and seeking to disenfranchise 74 million plus American voters and those who dare to share their political beliefs and vision of America. They hated the results of the 2016 election and want to use this impeachment process to further their political agenda. These elitists have mocked them for four years. They've called their fellow Americans who believe in their country and their constitution deplorables. And the latest talk is that they need to deprogram 
those who supported Donald Trump and the grand old party. But at the end of the day, this is not just about Donald Trump or any individual. This is about our Constitution and abusing the impeachment power for political gain. Excuse me. They tell us that we have to have this impeachment trial, such as it is, to bring about unity. But they don't want unity, and they know this so-called trial will tear the country in half, leaving tens of millions of Americans feeling left out of the nation's agenda, as dictated by one political party that now holds the power in the White House and in our national legislature. But these, they're proud Americans who never quit getting back up when they're down, and they don't take dictates from another party based on partisan force feeding. This trial will tear this country apart, perhaps like we have only seen once before in our history. And to help the nation heal, we now learn that the House managers, in their wisdom, have hired a movie company and a large law firm to create, manufacture, and splice for you a package designed by experts to chill and horrify you and our fellow Americans. They want to put you through a 16-hour presentation over two days focusing on this as if it were some sort of blood sport. And to what end? For healing? For unity? For accountability? Not for any of those. For they surely there are much better ways to achieve each. It is again for pure, raw, misguided partisanship that makes them believe playing to our worst instincts somehow is good. They don't need to show you movies to show you that the riot happened here. We will stipulate that it happened, and you know all about it. This is a process fueled irresponsibly by base hatred by these House managers and those who gave them their charge, and they are willing to sacrifice our national character to advance their hatred and their fear that one day they might not be the party in power. They have a very different view of democracy and freedom from Justice Jackson. who once wrote, but freedom to differ is not limited to things that do not matter much. That would be a mere shadow of freedom. The test of its substance is the right to differ as to things that touch at the heart of the existing order. They have a very different view of democracy and freedom. This is nothing less than the political weaponization of the impeachment process, pure, raw, sport, fueled by the misguided idea of party over country, when in fact both will surely suffer. I can promise you that if these proceedings go forward, everyone will look bad. You will see and hear many members of our Congress saying and doing things they must surely regret, but perhaps far more worse, far worse than a moment of personal shame in a world in which history passes from our memories in a moment. Our great country, a model for all the world, will be far more divided, and our standing around the world will be badly broken. Our arch enemies who pray each and every day for our downfall will watch with glee, glowing in the moment as they see you at your worst and our country in internal divide. Let's be perfectly clear. If you vote to proceed with this impeachment trial, future senators will recognize that you bought into a radical constitutional theory that departs clearly from the language of the Constitution itself and holds, and this is in their brief, that any civil officer who ever dares to want to serve his or her country must know that they will be subject to impeachment long after their service in office has ended, subject only to the political and cultural landscape of the day that is in operation at any future time. This is exactly the position taken by the House managers at page 65 of their brief. Unprecedented, radical position. They unabashedly say so. Imagine the potential consequences for civil officers you know and who you, be you believed served so honorably, but who in the view of a future Congress might one day be deemed to be impeachment worthy. Imagine it now because your imagination is the only limitation. The House managers tell you a correct reading of the impeachment power under the Constitution is that it has no temporal limit. 
and can reach back in time without limitation to target anyone who dared to serve our nation as a civil officer. Now add that to their demand that your members, that you members put your imprimatur on the snap impeachment they returned in this case and can do again in the future if you endorse it by going forward with this impeachment trial. This is an untenable combination that literally puts the institution of the presidency directly at risk, nothing less. And it does much more. Under their unsupportable constitutional theory and tortured reading of the text, every civil officer who has served is at risk of impeachment if any given group elected to the House decides that what was thought to be important service to the country when they served now deserves to be canceled. They've made clear in public statements that what they really want to accomplish here in the name of the Constitution is to bar Donald Trump from ever running for political office again. But this is an affront to the Constitution, no matter who they target today. It means nothing less than the denial of the right to vote and the independent right for a candidate to run for elective political office, guaranteed by the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution, under the guise of impeachment as a tool to disenfranchise. Perhaps my friend put the situation simply and sharply into focus last week on his radio show. My friend is a distinguished lawyer who served as an ambassador to former President Obama and has friends among you. He described himself to his listeners as a dyed-in-the-wool lifelong Democrat. But he said, the idea of a hundred people in these circumstances deciding that tens of millions of American voters cannot cast their vote for their candidate for president ever again is unthinkable, and it truly should be. I will discuss today several reasons this matter should not and must not proceed, why the Senate lacks jurisdiction to conduct this trial of a former president, a president no longer in office and now a private citizen, any single reason in our trial memorandum or discussed today suffices. But I want to start with a discussion of the fundamental due process lacking from the start. And that would last through the end if this goes forward, because it is this irretrievably flawed process and its product, a dangerous snap impeachment that brings us here and that threatens to send a message into the future that we will all regret forever and that stain this body, which up to now, our founding fathers believed was uniquely suited for the most difficult task of conducting an impeachment trial, as Mr. Hamilton wrote in Federalist 65. These aren't just niceties. I make no apology for demanding in your name, in the name of the Constitution, that the rights to due process guaranteed under the Constitution are adhered to in a process as serious as this in our national lives. The denial of due process in this case, of course, starts with the House of Representatives. In this unprecedented snap impeachment process, the House of Representatives denied every attribute of fundamental constitutional due process that Americans correctly have come to believe is part of what makes this country so great. How and why did that happen? It is a function of the insatiable lust for impeachment in the House for the past four years. Consider this. I want to say this for Donald Trump, who I may well be voting to impeach. Donald Trump has already done a number of things which legitimately raise the question of impeachment. I don't respect this president, and I will fight every day until he is impeached. That is grounds to start impeachment proceedings. Those are grounds to start impeachment. Those are grounds to start impeachment proceedings. Yes, I think that's grounds to start impeachment proceedings. I rise today, Mr. Speaker, to call for the impeachment of the President of the United States of America. I continue to say, impeach him! Impeach 45! Impeach 45! So we're calling upon the House to begin impeachment hearings immediately on the impeachment of Donald Trump. Would you vote yes or no? I would vote yes. I would vote, I would vote too much. Because we're gonna go in there, we're gonna impeach the mother 
but the fact is, I introduced articles of impeachment in July of 2017. If we don't impeach this president, he will get reelected. My oath requires me to be for impeachment, have an impeachment hearing. He needs to scarlet eye, eye on his chest. The representative should begin impeachment proceedings against this president. It is time to bring impeachment charges against him. Bring impeachment charges. My personal view is that uh, he richly deserves impeachment. I'm here at an impeachment rally. And we are ready to impeach the... The relevant timeline in the House reveals the rush to judgment. On the day following the January 6th riot, the House leadership cynically sensed a political opportunity to score points against the outgoing then-President Trump. And the Speaker demanded that Vice President Pence invoke the 25th Amendment, threatening immediate impeachment for the President if Mr. Pence did not comply with this extraordinary and extraordinarily wrong demand. Four days later, on January 11th, 2021, the instant article of impeachment was introduced in the House. Speaker Pelosi then gave Bryce, Vice President, the Vice President another ultimatum, threatening to begin impeachment proceedings within 24 hours if he did not comply. Vice President Pence rejected Speaker Pelosi's demand, favoring instead adherence to the Constitution and the best interests of the nation over a politically motivated threat. On January 12th, Speaker Pelosi announced who the nine impeachment managers would be. And on January 13th, 2021, just days after holding a press conference to announce the launching of an inquiry, the House adopted the article of impeachment. Completing the fastest impeachment inquiry in history and according President Trump, no due process at all over strong opposition based in large part on the complete lack of due process. To say there was a rush to judgment by the House would be a grave understatement. It is not as if the House members who voted to impeach were not mightily warned about the dangers to the institution of the presidency and, about our system, and to our system of due process, they were warned in the strongest of terms from within their own ranks, adamantly, clearly, and in no uncertain terms, not to take this dangerous snap impeachment course. Those warnings were framed in the context of the constitutional due process that was denied here. Consider the warnings given by one member during the House proceedings, pleading with the other members to accord this decision the due process the Constitution demands. This is Representative Cole of Oklahoma. With only one week to go in his term, the majority is asking us to consider a resolution impeaching President Trump. And they do so knowing full well that even if the House passes the resolution, the Senate will not be able to begin considering these charges until after President Trump's term ends. I can think of no action the House can take that is more likely to further divide the American people than the action we are contemplating today. Emotions are clearly running high, and political divisions have never been more apparent in my lifetime, Representative Cole said. Mr. Cole's words on the floor, emphasizing the care that must be taken with respect to the consideration of an article of impeachment, echoed the concerns by our founding fathers on this subject. Listen to this from Mr. Hamilton in Federalist Number 65. Quote, a well-constituted court for the trial of impeachments is an object not more to be desired than difficult to be obtained in a government wholly elective. The prosecution of them, for this reason, will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and to divide into parties more or less friendly or inimical, inimical to the accused. In many cases, it will connect itself with pre-existing factions and will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence, and interest on one side or on the other. In such cases, there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. Prescient thinking by Mr. Hamilton, as we see often. And what I say to you is a proof of the need for due process based on the critically serious nature of the singular role the impeachment process has in our government. Mr. Hamilton characterized the consideration of an impeachment in these terms, the delicacy and magnitude of a trust which so deeply concerns the political reputation and existence of every man engaged in the administration of public affairs speak for themselves. This too in Federalist 65. Now back to the House and the warnings against this rush judgment in this case. Mr. Cole of Oklahoma again. In the name of healing, a path forward, he said, our people so desperately need, he warned that, quote, 
The House is moving forward erratically with a truncated process that does not comport with the modern practice and that will give members no time to contemplate the serious nature of action before us. Mr. Cole emphasized to his colleagues that such care must be taken with the consideration of an article of impeachment, quote, in order to ensure that the American people have confidence in the procedures the House is following. And because the presidency itself demands due process in the impeachment proceedings. Congressman Cole continued, unfortunately, this is a quote, the majority has chosen to race to the floor with a new article of impeachment, foregoing any investigation, any committee process, or any chance for members to fully contemplate this course of action before proceeding. Mr. Cole complained that the majority is failing to provide the House with an opportunity to review all the facts which are still coming to light to discuss all the evidence, to listen to scholars, to examine the witnesses, and to consider precedents. He noted further, this is not the type of robust process we have followed for every modern impeachment, and the failure to do so does a great disservice to this institution and to this country, Mr. Cole said. Mr. Cole complained right on the House floor that rather than following the appropriate processes, he said, the House has used, in every modern impeachment, the majority is rushing to the floor, tripping all over themselves in their rush to impeach the president, impeach the president a second time. And in Mr. Cole's wor words, it was doing so to, quote, settle scores. And he warned that this snap imp impeachment approach would cause great division as the country looks ahead to the start of a new administration. He said to them, in a matter as, gr as grave and consequential as impeachment, shouldn't we follow the same process we've used in every modern impeachment rather than rushing to the floor? And he implored them, on behalf of generations of Americans to come, we need to think more clearly about the consequences of our action today. And Mr. Cole then reached across the aisle and credited a member of this body, Senator Manchin, with having voiced similar sentiments about how ill-advised ill this rushed process was, suggesting that the underlying events were a matter for the judicial system to investigate, not one for a rushed political process. Finally, Mr. Cole admonished his fellow House members, telling them, we need to recognize that we are following a flawed process. The alarm Mr. Cole sounded went unheeded. Now let us consider the process in the House that actually was due. The House managers assert in a memorandum that the House serves as a grand jury and prosecutor under the Constitution. They told you that again today. If this is accurate, then they highlight the complete failure to adhere to due process. One should not diminish the significance of impeachment's legal aspects, particularly as they relate to the formalities of the criminal justice process. It is a hybrid of the political and legal, a political process moderated by for legal formalities. This is a quote, Richard Broughton. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution provides in relevant part that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Supreme Court long ago recognized in Matthews versus Eldridge that at its core, due process is about what we all want, what we all have the right to demand, fundamental fairness. One scholar, Brian Owsley, has written that the impeachment process should and does include some of the basic safeguards for the accused that are observed in a criminal process, such as fairness, due process, presumption of innocence, and proportionality, basic American values. And of course, we know that the Supreme Court has recognized that due process protection attend congressional investigations. While Congress is empowered to make its own rules of proceeding, it may not make rules ignore, that ignore con constitutional restraints or violate fundamental rights. Excuse me. While the case law is limited in terms of spelling out what due process looks like in impeachment hearings, and of course in the Nixon case, Walter, not Richard, we know that there's a great deal of leeway afforded Congress with respect to its impeachment rules. It is clear that the fundamental principles that underlie our understanding of what due process must always look like apply. In Hastings versus United States, DC court case, 
reversed, vacated on different grounds. They addressed the matter, clearly concluding that the due process clause applies to impeachment proceedings and that it imposes an independent constitutional constraint on how the Senate exercises its sole power to try all impeachments under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6. The court wrote in Hastings, impeachment is an extraordinary remedy. As an essential element of our constitutional system of checks and balances, impeachment must be invoked and carried out with solemn respect and scrupulous attention to fairness. Fairness in due process must be the watchword whenever a branch of the United States government conducts a trial, whether it be in a criminal case, a civil case, or a case of impeachment. A 1974 Department of Justice memo suggested the same view, opining that, quote, whether or not capable of judicial enforcement, due process standards would seem to be relevant to the manner of, manner of conducting an impeachment proceeding. More specifically, as the Hastings Court described it, one of the key principles that lies at the heart of our constitutional democracy. Again, fairness. The Supreme Court's precedents establish the general rule, rule that individuals must receive notice and an opportunity to be heard before the government deprives them of a constitutionally protected interest. It is also true that in any proceeding that may lead to deprivation of a protected interest, it requires fair procedures commensurate with the interests at stake. Impeachment proceedings plainly involve deprivations of property and liberty interests protected by the Due Process Clause. And the House surely seeks to strip Donald Trump of his most highly cherished constitutional rights, including the right to be eligible to hold public office again, should he so choose. Due process must apply, and at a minimum, due process and the impeachment process must include that the evidence must be disclosed to the accused, and the accused must be permitted an opportunity to test and confront the evidence, particularly through the rights to confront and cross-examine witnesses, which have long been recognized as essential to due process. In almost every setting where important decisions turn on questions of fact, due process requires an opportunity to confront and cross-examine. It is unfathomable that the framers, steeped in the history of Anglo-American jurisprudence, would create a system that would allow the chief executive and commander-in-chief of the armed forces to be impeached based on a process that developed evidence without providing any of the elementary procedures that the common law developed over centuries for ensuring the proper testing of evidence in an adversarial process. We would never countenance such a system in this country. Current members of the House and Senate leadership are themselves on record repeatedly confirming these procedural due process requirements. Indeed, Congressman Nadler is on record asserting that in the context of a House impeachment investigation, due process includes, quote, the right to be informed of the law of the charges against you, to call your own witnesses, and to have the assistance of counsel. Then President Trump was not given any semblance of the due process Congressman Nadler clearly believes he deserves, based on the congressman's description of due process that must be afforded to an accused in an impeachment proceeding, as reflected in a statement he made relating to another impeachment in 1998. No reason was found for the apparent change in the congressman's point of view with respect to the two objects of the impeachment at issue. These fundamental attributes of due process have been honored as required parts of modern impeachment protocol since at least 1870. It's not seriously debatable, nor should it be, nor should it be by any American legislator. In spite of all this, the House leadership defied all the nor norms and denied the then president all of his basic and constitutionally protected rights. For then president Donald Trump, the House impeachment procedure lacked any semblance of due process, whatever. It simply cannot be credibly argued to the country. And we do not make special rules for different targets. It's the very integrity of the institution that suffers when we do, and that is what the House leadership knowingly has caused. A review of the House record reveals that the Speaker streamlined the impeachment process. House Resolution 24 to go straight to the floor for a two-hour debate and a vote without the ability for amendments. The House record reflects no committee hearing, no witnesses, no presentation or cross-examination of evidence, and no opportunity for the accused to respond or even have counsel present to object. As the New York Times recently reported, 
There were no witness interviews, no hearings, no committee debates, and no real additional fact-finding. House managers claimed the need for impeachment was so urgent that they had to rush the proceedings with no time to spare for a more thorough investigation, or really any investigation at all. But that claim is belied by what happened or didn't happen next. The House leadership unilaterally and by choice waited another 12 days to deliver the article to this Senate to begin the trial process. In other words, the House leadership spent more time holding the adopted article than it did on the whole process leading up to the adoption of the article. That intentional delay designed to avoid the, having the trial begin while Mr. Trump was still president led to yet another egregious denial of due process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Article 1, Section 3 of our uh, Clause 6 of our Constitution, of course, provides in pertinent part that the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. And when the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. By intentionally waiting until President Trump's, President Trump's term of office expired before delivering the article of impeachment to the Senate to initiate trial proceedings, Speaker Pelosi deprived then-President Trump of the express constitutional right and the right under the Senate's own Rule 4 to have the Chief Justice of the United States preside over his trial and wield the considerable power provided for in the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials. That power includes, under Rule 5, the presiding officer's exclusive right to make and issue all orders, under Rule 7, to make all evidentiary orders subject to objections by a member of the Senate. We say respectfully that this intentional delay by Speaker Pelosi, such that in the intervening period, President Trump became private citizen, Mr. Trump, constitutes a lapse or waiver of jurisdiction here. For Mr. Trump no longer is the president, described as subject to impeachment in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, and in Article 2, Section 4. And this body, therefore, has no jurisdiction as a function of that additional due process violation by Speaker Pelosi. Moreover, with all due respect, then-President Trump suffered a tangible detriment from Speaker Pelosi's actions, which violates not only his rights to due process of law, but also his express constitutional right to have the Chief Justice preside. That tangible detriment includes the loss of the right to a conflict-free, impartial presiding officer, with all due respect, the very purpose behind requiring the Chief Justice to preside over the President's impeachment trial, along with the other benefits of having the two branches combined, the Chief Justice from the Judiciary and the Senate, for the impeachment trial of the President, reflected in Federalist 66, one of the reasons the Chief Justice was chosen for that task. Mr. Trump now faces a situation in which the presiding officer will serve as both judge with all the powers that the rules endow him with and juror with a vote. And beyond that, the presiding officer, although enjoying a lifelong honorable reputation, of course, has been Mr. Trump's vocal and adamant opponent throughout the Trump administration, and in fact, in the very matter on trial, the presiding officer respectfully already has publicly announced his fixed view before hearing any argument or evidence that Mr. Trump must be convicted on the article of impeachment before the Senate, and indeed that members in both parties have an obligation to vote to convict as well. Nowhere in this great country would any American, and certainly not this honorable providing, presiding officer, consider this scenario to be consistent with any stretch of the American concept of due process and a fair trial, and certainly not even the appearance of either. By no stretch of the imagination could any fair-minded American be confident that a trial so conducted would or could be the fair trial promised by the leader. While most procedural aspects of a Senate impeachment trial may be non-justiciable political questions, this is not an excuse to ignore what law and precedent, precedent clearly require. The present situation either presents a violation of the constitutional text found in the articles mentioned above that require the Chief Justice to preside when the President is on trial, or it is a clear denial of due process and fair trial rights for private citizen Trump to face an impeachment trial so conducted by the Senate. 
the impeachment article should be treated as a nullity and dismissed based on the total lack of due process in the House. It should be dismissed because of Speaker Pelosi's intentional abandonment or waiver of jurisdiction, if the House ever acquired jurisdiction. And the article should be dismissed because the trial in the Senate of a private citizen is not permitted, let alone with the conflicts just described that attend this proceeding. Finally, on the subject of due process in this matter, I say the following. This is our nation's sacred constitution. It has served us well since it was written, and it's been amended only through a careful process. It is a document unique in all the world. It is a foundational part of what makes the United States a beacon of light among the other nations of the world. It not only has room for a tremendous variety of perspectives on the philosophical and political direction our country should take, it encourages the advocacy of our differences. But we have long held that fundamental to its health and well-being, and therefore to ours as a nation, is its insistence on due process for every citizen. The emphasis on the right to due process long ago was recognized as its life breath, a primary guarantor of its eternal viability as our political, civic, and national guiding light. We all well know that there are many systems in other countries around the world that do not offer any semblance of the safeguards our constitutional concept of due process provides. Some of them have chosen their own handbooks, which direct their citizens' conduct on penalty of death. This is one of them. There can be no room for due process in such a system as this, or the system would be lost. Snap decisions are required in a system like this to maintain power for one political philosophy over all others in those kinds of systems. But we as a nation have rejected those systems and the kind of snap decisions they demand to maintain control for one party, for one point of view, and for an imposed way of life. We choose to live freely under a constitution that guarantees our freedom. Other countries fear those freedoms and seek to ensure adherence to a party line in all civic, political, spiritual, and other affairs, and to ensure that the party line is towed and those systems have no place for due process. Snap decisions that remove political figures are the norm. Maintaining their systems depend on it. That is not our way in America and never must be. We choose in America to live by our Constitution and its amendments and the due process this document demands for every citizen among us. By putting your imprimatur on the snap judgment made in this matter to impeach the President of the United States without any semblance of due process at every step along the way puts the office of the President of the United States at risk every single day. It is far too dangerous a proposition to countenance and you must resoundingly reject it by sending the message now that this proceeding, lacking due process from start to finish, must end now with your vote that you lack jurisdiction to conduct an impeachment trial for a former president whose term in office has expired and who is now a private citizen. So one reason you must send this message here and now is because of the complete lack of due process that brought this article of impeachment before this body. God forbid we should ever lower our vigilance to the principle of due process. An impeachment trial of a private citizen Trump held before the Senate would be nothing more nor less than the trial of a private citizen by a legislative body. An impeachment trial by the Senate of a private citizen violates Article 1, Section 9 of the United States Constitution, which provides that no bill of attainder shall be passed. The bill of attainder, as this clause is known, <clears throat> prohibits Congress from enacting a law that legislative legislatively determines guilt and inflicts punishment upon an identifiable individual without provision of the protections of a judicial trial. A bill of attainder is a legislative act which inflicts punishment without a judicial trial. A judicial trial. The distinguishing characteristic of a bill of attainder is the substitution of a legislative determination of guilt 
and legislative imposition of punishment for judicial finding and sentence. The Bill of Attainder Clause and the Separation of Powers Doctrine generally reflects the framers' concern that trial by a legislature lacks the safeguards necessary to prevent the abuse of power. As the Supreme Court explained in United States versus Brown, the best available evidence, the writings of the architects of our constitutional system, indicate that the Bill of Attainder Clause was intended not as a narrow, technical, and therefore soon to be outmoded prohibition, but rather as an implementation of the separation of powers, a general safeguard against legislative exercise of the judicial function. More simply, trial by legislature. The Bill of Attainder reflected the framers' belief that the legislative branch is not so well suited as politically independent judges and juries. When the Senate undertakes an impeachment trial of a private citizen, as it clearly understands to be the case here, supported by the facts that the Chief Justice is not providing and Mr. Trump is not the president, it is acting as a judge and jury rather than a legislative body. And this is exactly the type of situation that the Bill of Attainder constitutional provision was meant to preclude. It is clear that disqualification from holding future office, the punishment the House managers intend to seek here, is a kind of punishment, like a banishment and others, that is subject to the constitutional prohibition against the passage of bills of attainder, under which, under which general designation bills of pains and penalties are included. The cases include Cummings, Ex parte Garland, and this Brown case. The Supreme Court three times has struck down provisions that precluded support of the South or support of communism from holding certain jobs as being in violation of this prohibition. Thus, the impeachment of a private citizen in order to disqualify them from holding office is an unconstitutional act constituting a bill of attainder. Moreover, this is the exact type of situation in which the fear would be great that some members of the Senate might be susceptible to acting in the haste the House acted in when it rushed through the article of impeachment in less than 48 hours, acting hastily simply to appease the popular clamor of their political base the very kind of concern expressed by Mr. Hamilton in Federalist 65. Moreover, as Chief Justice Marshall warned in Fletcher versus Peck, it is not to be disguised that the framers of the Constitution viewed with some apprehension the violent acts which might grow out of the feelings of the moment and that the people of the United States in adopting that instrument have manifested a determination to shield themselves and their property from the effects of those sudden and strong passions to which men and women are exposed. The restrictions on the legislative power of the states are obviously founded in this sentiment. And the Constitution of the United States contains what may be deemed a bill of rights for the people of each state. No state shall pass any bill of attender in this form. The power of the legislature over the lives and fortunes of individuals is expressly restrained. And so now let's turn to the text of the Constitution. <clears throat> Turning to the text of the Constitution is for many, of course, the most appropriate and the most important starting place for trying to answer a Constitution-based question. There are several passages of the United States Constitution that relate to the federal impeachment process. Let's turn to a reading of the text now. A true textual analysis, as the name implies, always begins with the words of the text and only resorts to legislative history or history itself, if the meaning of the text is not plain. As the Supreme Court has emphasized, statutory interpretation, as we always say, begins with the text. In interpreting the text, we are guided by the principle that the Constitution was written to be understood by the voters. Its words and phrases were used in their normal and ordinary, as distinguished from technical meaning. And we must enforce plain and un unambiguous statutory language according to its terms. If the president is impeached, the unambiguous text of the Constitution commands that the Chief Justice of the United States shall preside, as we discussed earlier. Again, the Chief Justice is disinterested and nonpartisan. His presence brings dignity and solemnity to such a proceeding. In this case, the Chief Justice clearly is not presiding. And the conflict of interest wouldn't necessarily just arise as a substitute for the Vice President. It's the appearance of a conflict of interest and, the pre and a conflict of interest and the prejudgment that we've discussed. 
In this case, as we say, the Chief Justice clearly is not presiding. The Senate President Pro Temp is presiding. It appears that in the leader's view, undoubtedly joined by other senators, this is permitted by the Constitution because the subject of the trial is a non-president. As such, it is conceded, as it must be, that for constitutional purposes of the trial, the accused is a non-president. The role of the Senate, though, is to decide whether or not to convict and thereby trigger the application of Article 2, Section 4, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for, conviction of, treasury, tre treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. From which office shall a non-president be removed if convicted? A non-president doesn't hold an office, therefore cannot be impeached under this clause, which provides for the removal from office of the person under the impeachment attack. The House managers contend that the fact that the Chief Justice is not providing does not impact the constitutional validity of this trial. Notably, they devote only a single paragraph of their trial memorandum to developments so significant that it prompted multiple senators to declare the entire proceeding suspect, with one going so far as to say that it crystallized the unconstitutional nature of this proceeding. And the single paragraph that the House managers do devote to the issue is entirely unpersuasive on the merits. The House manager's position ignores traditional statutory canons of interpretation. It is well established that a term, as a matter of statutory interpretation, that a term appearing in several places in a statutory text is generally read the same way each time it appears. This presumption is at its most vigorous when a term is repeated within a given sentence. Additionally, the court in at least one instance has referred to a broader, quote, established canon that similar language contained within the section of a statute be accorded a consistent meaning. I know this is a lot to listen to at once, a lot of words, but it, words are what make our Constitution, quite frankly, and the interpretation of that Constitution, as, as you well know, uh, a product of words. If the text, quote, the President of the United States in the constitutional provision requiring the Chief Justice to, to preside can refer only to the sitting President and not to former presidents, then the textual identification of the president contained in Article 2, Section 4, which makes the president amenable to impeachment in the first place, also excludes anyone other than the sitting president. In full, that sentence provides that, quote, the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. This is the substantive phrase of the Constitution vesting the conviction and removal power in the Senate, and it contains a clear jurisdictional limitation. The House managers do understand what the word president means for the purposes of other constitutional provisions, and so they should understand this limitation as well. Only a sitting president is referred to as the president of the United States in the Constitution, and only a sitting president may be impeached, convicted, and removed upon a trial in the Senate. The president in Article 2, Section 4, and the President in Article 1, Section 3, identify the same person. If the accused is not the President in one, he is not the President in the other. No sound textual interpretation. I emphasize textual. No sound textual interpretation principle permits a contrary reading. In the words of the Supreme Court, it is a normal rule of statutory construction that identical words used in different parts of the same act are intended to have the same meaning. Unwittingly or unwillingly, as it may be, Senate Democrats in their announcement that Senator Leahy is presiding have already taken their position on this matter. The accused is not the president. The text of the United States Constitution, therefore, does not vest the Senate with the power to try him and remove him, a factual nullity, he can't be removed, something, or disqualify him, a legal nullity, as if he were, were the president. House managers contend the Senate has jurisdiction over this impeachment because despite the fact that he's no longer the president, the conduct that the former president is charged occurred, occurred while he was still in office. That argument does not in any way alter the Constitution's clear textual identification of the president. House managers justify their strained argument by noting that the Constitution's impeachment provisions are properly understood by reference to this overarching constitutional plan. But with that very justification in mind, their argument fails once again. 
In an impeachment, it is the accused's office that permits the impeachment. Ceasing to hold that office terminates the possibility and the purpose of impeachment. Private persons may not be impeached in America. And so they asked you to look back at the British model. The Constitution, as I say, does not make private citizens subject to impeachment. The founders rejected the British model that allowed Parliament to impeach anyone except for the king. And so they limited impeachment to certain public officials, including presidents in our country. Next on the textual front, the primary, in fact, the only required remedy of conviction is removal. Article 2, Section 4, straightforward rule. Whenever a civil officer is impeached and convicted for high crimes and misdemeanors, they shall be removed. It is undeniable that in this instance, removal is moot in every possible regard. Removal is a factual and legal impossibility. Yet the article of impeachment itself, read it in the wherefore clause, it calls for removal. This is one reason why impeachment proceedings are different from ordinary trials and why the Constitution point, pointedly separates the two. In ordinary criminal jurisprudence, a person convicted of public crimes while he or she was in office may still be punished even though they no longer hold that office. Not so with impeachment. In a Senate impeachment trial, conviction means and requires removal. And conviction without a removal is no conviction at all. Only upon a valid conviction and its requisite, enforceable removal may the additional judgment of disqualification plausibly be entertained. Presidents are impeachable because presidents are removable. Former presidents are not because they cannot be removed. The Constitution is clear. Trial by the Senate sitting as a court of impeachment is reserved for the President of the United States, not a private citizen who used to be President of the United States. Just as clear, the judgment required upon conviction is removal from office, and a former president can no longer be removed from office. The purpose, text, and structure of the Constitution impeachment clauses confirm this intuitive and common sense understanding. So wrote Judge Michael Luddig, former judge in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth, Cir Fourth Circuit. And indeed, there are state court decisions that analyze this very same language and conclude that impeachment can only be entertained against an existing officer subject to removal. Read State versus Hill from Nebraska and Smith versus Brantley, 1981 decision from the Florida Supreme Court. This is the first time that the United States Senate has ever been asked to apply the Constitution's textual identification of the president in the impeachment provisions to anyone other than the sitting president of the United States. And of course, most significantly from a textual approach, the term specifically used is the president, not a president. And there can be only one president, the incumbent at a time. Judge Ludwig relies on this textual reading for his firm conclusion that a former president cannot be impeached or convicted. Consider the alternative as Robert Delahunty, Professor John, you have. If Mr. Trump can be convicted as the president, the language the Constitution uses, then why is he not still the president under the commander in chief clause, for example? They are joined by Professor Alan Dershowitz and University of Chicago professor Richard Epstein in their focus and conclusion. They point out the dangers of an approach that deviates from a focus on the text for there, if there is no temporal limitation. That's what they've suggested to you. Remember, you can go back in time and impeach any civil officer who ever served for anything that occurred during the course of their service. Time immemorial, immemorial. With the house manager's position, the concept necessarily includes all former executive officers and judges including perhaps the impeachment now of Jimmy Carter for his handling of the Iran hostage scandal as one example, that flows logically from their argument without any hesitation. Further, they ask, why not then countenance a broad reading of other terms? When I say they ask, I mean these uh, experts who have opined on this. Um, why not then countenance a broad reading of other terms, such as the terms like high crimes and misdemeanors, however broadly construed, are intended to be exclusively the only kind of conduct intended as impeachable. They conclude, these experts, that by writing that a non-textual impeachment power would undermine the Constitution's effort to make the president independent of Congress, a central goal of the Founding Fathers. The authors convincingly argue for textual analysis 
over non-textual analysis, uh, over non-textual reliance on a presentation of history, suggesting that if one's presentation of history were to control, it would expressly permit conduct contrary to the express language leading to clearly unintended results. And I must tell you that I've spoken to Judge Ken Starr at some length over this past week about this. And this, is a, this textual approach is something he too feels very strongly about. I also happen to be friendly with Chuck Cooper, by the way, who's a fine person. Um, also happens to be a person who has a strong animus against uh, President Trump. But Chuck Cooper is a fine lawyer and a fine person, um, as I'm sure uh, our friends from Alabama and, uh, know. As we already have discussed, the risks, risks to the institution of the presidency and to any and all past officers is limited only by one's imagination. The weakness of the House manager's case is further demonstrated by their reliance on the unproven assertion that if President Trump is not impeached, future officers who are impeached will evade removal by resigning, either before impeachment or Senate trial. For example, they contend, citing various law professors, that, quote, any official who betrayed the public trust and was impeached could avoid accountability simply by resigning one minute before the, Senate, the uh, Senate's final conviction vote. This argument is a complete canard. The Constitution expressly provides in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7, that a convicted party following impeachment shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law after removal. Clearly, a, formal, a former civil officer who's not impeached is subject to the same. We have a judicial process in this country. We have an, executive, an investigative process in this country to which no former office holder, holder is immune. That's the process that should be running its course. That's the process the Bill of Attainder tells us is the appropriate one for investigation, uh, prosecution, and punishment with all of the attributes that that branch we're missing it by two articles here. That the Article Three uh, courts provide. They provide that kind of appropriate uh, adjudication. That's accountability. <clears throat> there are appropriate mechanisms in place for full and meaningful accountability, not through the legislature, which does not and cannot offer the safeguards of the judicial system which every private citizen is constitutionally entitled. But more to the point here, their argument does nothing to empower a different reading of the Constitution's plain text. That is, one that reads the president in one provision to include former presidents, but reads the president in the other provision to mean only the sitting president. Second, this red herring of an argument also fails because the former president did not resign, even amid calls for, by his opponents that he do so. As a result, the Senate need not decide whether it possesses the power or jurisdiction to try and convict a former president who resigned, or how it might best proceed to effectuate justice in such a case. That's not this case. The plain meaning of the Constitution's text, faithfully and consistently applied, should govern whether the United States Senate is vested by the Constitution with the power to convict a private citizen of the United States. It is not. The House managers posit in their trial memorandum that despite the fact that the primary and only necessary remedy upon conviction, removal, is a legal nullity, this late impeachment trial is appropriate because the other secondary optional remedy that the Senate is not even required to consider and which only takes effect upon a later separate vote, disqualification from future office, can still theoretically be applied to a former president. The managers contend Articles 2, Section 4, states a straightforward rule. Whenever a civil officer is impeached and convicted for high crimes and misdemeanors, they shall be removed. Absolutely nothing about this rule implies, let alone requires, that former officials who can still face disqualification are immune from impeachment and conviction. That's what they say. They told you that today. In other words, so the argument goes, a president no longer holding office does not moot the entirety of remedies affording by impeachment. This, however, also flies in the face of both the plain meaning of the text and the canons of statutory interpretation. First of all, the managers once again simply to choose to ignore the text. Even in the passage that the managers cite, the word shall, does, to put it mildly, imply a requirement. An imperative such that an impeachment in which removal would be impossible is invalid. Shall means shall. The Supreme Court has made clear that when a statute uses the word shall, 
Congress has imposed a mandatory duty upon the subject of the command, as in shall remove. Indeed, the mandatory shall normally creates an obligation impervious to judicial discretion. And wherever the Constitution commands, discretion terminates. Shall means mandatory, and shall be removed is not possible for a former officer no longer in office. Impeachment cannot apply. Now here's the and argument. You may have heard about, read about, if you follow such things. This is another one Judge Starr is big on, and many of the textual scholars have written about. S Managers critically ignore this language in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7, which states that judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification, for, sorry, from office, comma, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Ordinarily, as in everyday English, English use of the conjunct conjunctive and in a list means that all of the listed requirements must be satisfied, while use of the disjunctive or means that only one of the listed requirements needs to be satisfied. Judge Kenneth Starr subscribes strongly to this argument and understands the comma to provide further support for the reading. And Judge Michael Luddig, again, recently argued, the Constitution links the impeachment remedy of disqualification from future office with a remedy of removal from the office that person currently occupies. The former remedy does not apply in situations where the latter is unavailable. Conviction and removal are inextricably intertwined. If removal no longer is possible, neither is an impeachment conviction. Judge Luddig's view is consistent with that of just Joseph Story, Justice Joseph Story, in his famous commentaries on the Constitution, wherein Story, Justice Story analyzed impeachment is inapplicable to officials who have left their position because removal, a primary remedy that the impeachment process authorizes, is no longer necessary. Judge uh, Story, Justice Story, noted that he is not uh, coming to a, uh, a firm posit on this. this. This is his belief, and this is his thought process. There's also much force in the remark that an impeachment is a proceeding purely of a political nature. It is not so much designed to punish an offender as to secure the state against gross official misdemeanors. It touches neither his person nor his property, but simply divests him of his political ca capacity. Professor Philip Bobbitt. Now, this is, I have to say this is insulting. We heard earlier today, we don't cite any scholars. Professor Philip Bobbitt is the distinguished Wexler professor at Columbia University who, along with Professor Charles Black, wrote the handbook on impeachment used for many, many years. He is a constitutional expert on impeachment. Um, he has written that there is little discussion in the historical record surrounding the precise question of whether a person no longer a civil officer can be impeached. And in light of the clarity of the text, this is hardly surprising, Professor Bobbitt wrote. Professor Bobbitt, by the way, who has a rich family history in the Democratic Party, um, LBJ, um, also asserted the following as recently as January 27, 2021, arguing against holding this trial. He said, quote, there is no authority granted to Congress to impeach and convict persons who are not civil officers of the United States. It's as simple as that. But simplicity doesn't mean unimportance, Professor Bobbitt wrote. Limiting Congress to its specified powers is a crucial element in the central idea of the United States Constitution putting the state under law. Professor Bobbitt and former Stanford professor, University Law Professor Richard Danzig have remarked that impeachment's principal purpose, as the 66th of the Federalist Papers makes clear, is to check the encroachments of the executive. Trial by jury, rules of evidence, and other safeguards are put aside, they write, because of the need to protect the publish from public from further abuse of office. Similar yesterday, similarly, yesterday, Professor Eugene Konarovich wrote, the Constitution provides that the impeachment process is to be used to remove all civil officers of the United States, that is, people holding a government position. Yet in the case of Mr. Trump, the House is reading the Constitution as if it said the process applies to all civil officers of the United States and people who aren't civil officers but once were, exactly what it does not say. <clears throat> We've been told by the House managers about mis miscitations in our brief. I'd like to draw your attention to page 37, 
This is a substantive misrepresentation to you, I would respectfully suggest. And it show, reflects to me a very different view of democracy, a fear of democracy. They wrote on page 37 of their brief that the framers, I'm paraphrasing the first part, the framers themselves would not have hesitated to convict on these facts. Their worldview, this is a quote now, was shaped by a study of classical history as well as a lived experience of resistance and resolution. They were aware of the danger posed by opportunists who incited mobs to violence for political gain. They drafted the Constitution to avoid such thuggery, which they associated with the threat of civil disorder and early assumption of power by a dictator. The citation is 178, Bernard Balin, The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. That's this book. Professor Balin, when he gave this description of the threat of civil disorder and the early assumption of power by a dictator and thuggery, was referring to early colonists' view toward democracy. They feared democracy. That's what they call thuggery. Democracy, because it's an elitist point of view, an elitist political point of view. We don't fear democracy. We embrace it. In summing up, let's be crystal clear on where we stand and why we are here. The singular goal of the House managers and House leadership in pursuing the impeachment conviction of Donald J. Trump is to use these proceedings to disenfranchise at least 74 million Americans with whom they viscerally disagree, and to ensure that neither they nor any other American ever again can cast a vote for Donald Trump. And if they convince you to go forward, their ultimate hope is that this will be a shot across the bow of any other candidate for public office who would dare to take up a political message that is very different from their own political point of view as the direction in which they wish to take our country. Under our Constitution, this body and the impeachment process must never be permitted to be weaponized for partisan political purposes. This article of impeachment must be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction based on what we have discussed here today and what's in our brief. The institution of the presidency is at risk unless a strong message is sent by the dismissal of the article of impeachment. Before we close, I want to leave you with two thoughts. One was expressed by Abraham Lincoln. He comes to mind first because of the way in which our nation is now divided. We must learn from his times. He had a simple but important message about the paramount importance of doing what is right. Mr. Lincoln said, stand with anybody that stands right, stand with him when he is right, and part with him when he goes wrong. In both cases, you are right. In both cases, you oppose the dangerous extremes. In both cases, you stand on moral ground and hold the ship level and steady. In both, you are national and nothing less than national. And the second message is from one of Mr. Lincoln's favorite poets, who wrote in 1849 at a time fraught with division and risk for even more. The message from that other time of division is a call for hope and unity to bring strength. It has special meaning today. Poet Longfellow wrote, sail forth, <clears throat> sail forth into the sea, O ship, through wind and wave, right onward steer. The moistened eye, the trembling lip are not the signs of doubt or fear. Sail forth into the sea of life, O gentle, loving, trusting wife and safe from all adversity upon the bosom of that sea, thy comings and thy goings be. For gentleness and love and trust prevail o'er angry wave and gust, and in the wreck of noble lives something immortal still survives. Thou too sail on, O ship of state, sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, in, is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what master laid thy keel, what workman wrought thy ribs of steel, who make each mask and sail and rope, what anvil, anvils rang, what hammers beat, in what a forge and what a heat were shaped the angers of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock, tis of the wave, <coughs> excuse me, tis of the wave and not the rock, tis but the flapping of the sail and not a rent made by the gale. In spite of rock and tempest's roar, in spite of false lights on the shore, sail on, not fear to breast the sea, our hearts our hopes are all with thee. Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant, triumphant over our fears are all with thee, are all with thee.